starting with uh, the module two quiz. Question one was true or false. Extrapolation is typically used to extend the system response curves. So that is going to be false. Uh, we want teams to define the full uh, the system response curve for the full range of loading um, up to top of dam, typically, or top of levee, depending on what kind of structure you're dealing with. Um, main reason for that is we don't want unexpected results. We want teams to actually evaluate, and linearly interpolating might not give you the, um, a reasonable probability for those stages. So um, we try to avoid extrapolation wherever possible. All right, question two. When discretizing a stage frequency curve, which of the following is false? So from this list here, um, it's going to be that first one, that hazard intervals must be even. Typically, that's how we do it, but it is not a requirement. And there are also um, certain times when, uh, because of inflection points in your stage frequency curve or inflection points in your system response or even your consequence functions, that you might want more resolution around those stages. So you can make the intervals smaller around those particular areas to make sure that you get a more precise result. Um, looking at the other ones, our hazard interval should always encompass the full range of loading. And then our last interval would be for the hazard greater than the highest hazard in the relationship. So the correct answer for that one is that first one. All right, so in question number three, we're, at, we're given some data and we're asked to calculate the annual probability of failure. So the annual probability of failure is gonna be um, the product of the hazard probability and their system response probability um, at each stage partition all summed together. So the correct answer for that one is going to be 2.78 times 10 to the minus 2. So we're taking the hazard probability from the first partition, multiplying it by its uh, corresponding system response, and then so on and so forth. This one's for the this turns for the second partition, the third partition, and then the, the final one there. I think most everybody should be pretty good with the APF calculation, given all the work we've done in the last couple of modules. So. All right, question four is to calculate the average annual life loss. We're given the annual probability of failure, day and night exposure rates, and then day and night life loss. So to do this one, it's going to be our exposure weighted life loss multiplied by the APF. Correct answer is going to be the third one there, 7.52 times 10 to the minus 3. So I'm taking the day exposure and multiplying it by the day life loss, adding to that the night exposure times the night life loss, and then that entire quantity is multiplied by the annual probability of failure. And then the last question. Uh, which of the following is not included in the probability of inundation calculation? So we're looking for the annual probability of inundation, the API. So when we do that, we're looking for um, the APF of all prior to overtopping failure modes, and we're adding to that the annual exceedance probability for um, the overtopping stage. So the correct answer for this one is going to be overtopping with breach. So we're not including the um, probability of failure by overtopping. We only need um, the annual exceedance probability for overtopping. So that last one there is going to be your correct response. All right, so any questions on the uh, quiz questions? Pretty simple and straightforward, I think. All right. So let's get into homework three. So for homework three, we're asked to um, generate the FN for the uh, following data. We've got uh, headwater and PGA partitions that are provided in these tables, and we're going to we're told to use linear interpolation for all system response probabilities. So this should be a, a fairly straightforward uh, example of how to handle 
a single seismic failure mode. All right, so we have our seismic hazard here up top, and we've got our size or stage duration relationship right here. So the first thing we need to do is get our joint loading. So I'm going to start with the uh, seismic hazard. We need to interpolate to get our annual exceedance probabilities. Anytime we're dealing with a seismic hazard curve, because that's plotted on a, a logarithmic scale, we're going to want to use semi-log interpolation. So we're going to go in log int, and then my x value is going to be that first value there. And I need my um, x-array, which is going to be this list of PGAs up top. And my y array is going to be the annual exceedance probabilities. One for ascending, zero to not extrapolate. I have my first um, set of PGA values there. Now, again, it's pulling 1.5 times 10 to the minus 1, which lines up with a 0.035 PGA. Um, that's going to be fine for us because we're going to include non-exceedance, but you can see how this first value is actually outside the range of this seismic hazard. So it's going to pull the lowest value. Okay, so I can take that and drag that down, and it'll give me everything I need for all of those except for um, this one. I can go ahead and delete that. So it's just a greater than sign. And then I'm going to repeat that process for um, the second PGA that defines the interval. So I can copy that over, drag this guy. I should have all of those, okay? So then to get the probability of each interval, I'm going to subtract the first AE. I'm going to take the first AEP and subtract from it the second AEP. Then I can drag that down, and that'll work for everyone. But the last one, the last one is just equal to the annual exceedance probability for uh, 0.7G there. So that's most of what I need to do, but I need to go back and add in the uh, non-exceedance probability to the first interval. So to do that, I'm going to add 1 minus the AEP of that first PGA right there. So if I've done that correctly. Just as a check, we can sum all those values, and I should get a value of exactly 1, and I do. So we should be in good shape there. Okay. So the next, I need to do the exact same thing for uh, stage, and really this should say um, stage DEP, AEP, because we're dealing with a duration exceedance probability. But anyway, so for this one, we're going to interpolate linearly. So that's going to be lin int, and I get my first value there, x-ray. Y array, one comma zero. I should have my first um, duration exceedance probability there. Drag all those down, and then I will do the same thing for the second row. And because of how it's set up, I should just be able to drag that down and over. It should be set. Okay. So like we did before, the probability of an interval is going to be the uh, DEP for headwater A minus the DEP for headwater B. So I will take this first number and subtract from it the second number. I can drag that across. And then the last one will just be the duration exceedance probability for my last stage. Okay, I need to go add in the non-exceedance probability like we did before. And then if I've done that correctly, all of these guys should sum to 1, and they do. All right, so now I have the probabilities that I need to start making the rest of the joint loading table. So to do that, I'm going to multiply the uh, 
seismic hazard probability by the um, stage duration probability. So I'll take this first value here, multiply it by this one here, and then we need to be careful so that we can um, drag this formula over and down. So we need to lock some cells here. So we need to lock the column for this first value. So we want the dollar sign in front of the letter. And this one, we want to lock the row. So the dollar sign will go between the letter and the number. So I've got my first value there. I should be able to drag and drop. And then again, if everything is correct, that sum should be one, and it is. Okay. Any questions on the uh, joint loading table? All right. So then next step, I've got the uh, risk assessment data for the potential failure mode. So we're going to need to populate the system Amen. response table. Yeah, go ahead. I apologize. I was unmuting slowly. Uh, the addition of the probability below the range of cells we have, where you have to stick in the adding of the initial zero to minimum risk in the probability calculation, that's an artifact of how the table is constructed. It's pretty easy to see that you could change the table and you wouldn't have to add that in. And yet, was a definite intentional choice to build the tables this way. Are, are you you're, you're referring to these last, these last rows here? Uh, no. The, the leftmost row in headwater B AEP, or in probability below headwater B AEP, the 2.980 minus 2. 2.980 minus 2. It's a probability. It's the first probability in the top row or in the third row. Oh, this one right here. Yes. Yeah. So we have to add that in for the first increment from zero, right? It's the probability yeah. range starts at zero. You can adjust the table, and then you don't have to add that in. It's it's one of the oh. columns. Agreed. Why, why so, does so that what, not work very well? Why does what not work very well? So. I think what you're suggesting is if I had wanted to, instead of pulling this probability, I could have just used a value of one, correct? Uh, I think I'm suggesting you can add another column and have an initial increment ah. from zero to the first value. And then the equation would be the same all the way across. Yes, you could do that. Um, the other thing you can do and this is what I typically do in practice, I don't even bother interpolating for this one. Or if I do, I just override it with a, a one, because that's basically what's happening. So when I take this equation and I simplify it, you can see how G48, I've got a plus G48 and I got a minus G48. So they're basically just canceling each other out, right? Exactly. So the, yeah, so the other way to do it would have been if I had just, you know, had that, and I just override that to make it a 1.0. Yeah, th th those are all certainly options. Okay, but the tables are uniformly constructed this way, so there's an advantage somewhere in doing it this way rather than having the extra column somewhere. I'm, I'm not following. Okay. So, like if, so you're saying... Something like, like that, then I would do... Uh, maybe, but it would be in its own column, right? Because it's the next increment of probability below that, or above that, I guess. But from 2.980 oh, right. minus 2 up to 1. I, I see what you're saying. So you're, you're suggesting that we would have add, added something for less than 177.1. Yes, and and that occurs in multiple tables all through our toolboxes and homework, but I can't see where it it would be a dumb idea to do that. And yet, like Tim O'Leary had a reason at some point, right? 
Well, so again, you can put that in there, but I mean, so it, it it's all personal preference, really. Okay, okay, Th that's what I was fishing for. This is the way it worked out being. Thank you. Yeah, so so generally what we do just to, you know, starting in that first cell is pulling from that whatever first stage defines your relationship. And I suppose if you'd wanted to, you could make it less than and then calculate through. But then if you're doing it that way, you know, what problem, what headwater do you want to use? You know, I guess you could use 177.1 for that and you'd get a slightly different answer. But, you know, the probability of that bin is typically so small that we just lump it into the first one. Really, it, it, it basically it's imprecision in how we're integrating to make it work. Does that make sense? Yes, and that might actually be what I was asking too. Thank you. Very good. All right. So let's make sure that I got Before you... everything here right. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, before you move on, I have a question, and it might you know, even go back to um, some of our earlier lessons. So if it's something that I just don't understand already uh, yet, I apologize. But <clears throat> the selection to use um, log for a um, set of AEPs versus using um, linear, that's pretty much based on how you present the data. So for example, the PGAs are generally on a log scale. Stage yes. frequency is generally on a log scale. But we chose linear here because we have a duration, which is usually on a on a regular scale. Yep. Okay. So the 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 one correction I would have is stage frequency is generally on a probability scale. Oh That's right. That's why we'll stage frequency is typically going to be Z variant. Okay. So basically, yeah, basically when we present that data and we have those curves, when we interpolate, we want the points that we're pulling to be on those curves. Right. So if they're right, right, right. how they're plotted, then we need to use the correct interpolation routine to match the data from those curves. Okay. So if we had um, stage duration, what would the equation be to um, interpolate that? It's lin. Like in, if we, yeah, in essentially G48, what would be that equation? It would be, G. yes. Lin N. Yeah. Um, I'm saying if we had, instead of headwater, if we had stage frequency, what would we oh, use then? It would be Lin Z. And okay, just Lin Z? Yes. So linear interpolation Z. Yeah, so the, the stage portion of it is always going to be linear probability portion, again, depends on what relationship you're looking at. So it would be Z for stage frequency. It would be linear for duration exceedance probability. So can think, you, are just um, seismic, I guess, what are some other examples of, of where we would use lin log? Um, outflow is typically going to be log. So if you've okay. got like an outflow curve that would be uh, log Z um, trying to think of some other things that might be log that's the first one that inflow and outflow are the ones that come to mind I want to say that there was a list in module two okay sorry no you're good I'll pull that up real quick make sure I'm not forgetting something I'll reference that as well. Yeah, here you go. So okay. again, log is typically what we're going to use for AEP inflow and outflow, and then also system response probabilities. Okay. Damon, hey Damon, but you say usually appropriate. Um, so my question is that when you, you know, just uh, restrict this, you know, usage of the interpolation method, uh, saying usually 
is that possible that when we don't know anything um, about the data, the behavior of data we have, is that possible that we just plot a graph, take a look at that, you know, uh, try different, you know, graphs and see which method is fitting best? Basically, yeah. So again, like, like the slide suggests, we're going to select a method that best approximates the straight line. So, so for selecting you, that method, for, for selecting that method, what would be your strategy? Is just plotting first hand in the blending, you know, plot and then, you know, tweak the axis to see you can see any correlation or, you know, good uh, feeding curve for the data? Sorry, I caught about half of that question. Can you, can you say that one more time? Okay. So what I'm saying is that when you don't know which method is the best fit, uh, how do you start? What's your starting point? Just, you know, graph your, yeah, that's it. Okay. So basically you graph it and you just take a look at that and, you know, you tweak the axis and see which one is the best, right? Correct. Yes. You would tweak the axis and then I find it helpful to use yeah. the tool that's already Excel to a trend line and then you can look at your r-squared values but so, one thing one thing i will say with all the interpolation stuff um especially for um it really depends on how many different stages or how many different points are used to define the relationship the more points you have that are defining your stage frequency curve or your system response curve or whatever you're interpolating from, the less it's going to matter. The more space you have in between, so the fewer points you have, the more it could matter, if that makes sense. So the first so judge your, your eyes, you just take a look at your data and, you know, to see uh, which would be the best. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Very good. And any other questions with that? So again, the, the, there's certain relationships that, you know, are always plotted the same way, which, you know, more or less follows that linearization scheme. And that's one of the reasons why they're plotted that way. Um, so you can be pretty confident in the, um, you know, Again, like using um, Z varied interpolation for your stage frequency curve, linear for your duration exceedance probability, um, semi log for your seismic hazard. But for things like system response, I mean, you can plot them out. And like, like I said in module two, you know, you can see the difference between um, log here versus Z variate. The difference isn't that much. And really, the difference wouldn't be too much if we did linear as well. So, you know, we typically will use log for system response just because it's a heck of a lot easier to plot in Excel than Z variant. And if we're pretending that, you know, we're so good that we can estimate those probabilities, you know, to second and third decimal places and be, you know, be correct, I think we're, we're tricking ourselves. You know, generally a, a risk estimate feel pretty good if you're within an order of magnitude or so of what the actual probability is. So in most instances, what you're using for interpolation isn't going to matter a, a whole, whole lot. Does that help? Yes, thank you. All right, so picking up where we left off, we've got our joint loading matrix now, and we need to interpolate to get our um, system response cable. We were told at the top to use linear interpolation, um, a lot of zeros in that one, so that's a good reason to do that. So one thing that we got to be careful, so this is going to be two-way interpolation. So the function is going to be by lin int. Uh, we're going to have two inputs, X and Y, and the order, which one we choose, is going to be really important. So the way the macro is written is this first column right here 
is going to be the X value. And then the top row is going to be the Y value. There were a, a couple people who had that reversed. And if it's reversed, the, the back row will not work. So we need to pull the, and really it's not so much this table that we're pulling from, it's this table. So X values are going to be PGA and the Y values are going to be our stage. So my first X is going to be here. Please leave me your name and phone number. When you speak your phone number, please speak slowly and leave it for me twice. And okay. All right. So I've got my X value, which is going to be the PGA, the Y value, which will be the headwater. And then I'm going to come up here and I'm going to pick the X array and then the Y array, and then the Z array is going to be the rest of the table here. We'll lock all of those. Okay. And then I'm going to have two, two sets of inputs for extrapolation and then two sets of, excuse me, two sets of um, inputs for the order. Both of those are going to, they're in ascending order, so those are going to be ones. And then two sets of inputs for extrapolation. We don't want to extrapolate, so those are zeros. Um, the other thing I need to do, kind of like we did in the table above, I need to make sure that I lock the appropriate rows and columns so I can drag this guy. So I want to lock the column of this first input and then the row of the second input. So again, I've got my PGA, which is the X value, Headwater is the Y value, the X array, the Y array, Z array, one because the X values are ascending, one because the Y values are ascending, and then zero for both because we're not extrapolating. So this first value should be zero. I should be able to drag this over and down and complete the table. Okay. Questions on that part? All right, so then from here, I can calculate the annual probability of failure. That's going to be the uh, loading probability times the system response. So with the way everything's set up, I can come up here. I'm going to pick this first one here. Originally, when I put this together, I had tried to make the outer part of this um, area of the table like a, a darker shading, but it really screwed things up when you were like dragging over and down because it was pulling the formatting. But anyway, I'm pulling again my first joint loading, and then I'm going to multiply that by the corresponding system response probability. And I should be able to drag those over and down. So we're just doing a bunch of matrix math. So down here, it should be bottom corner times bottom corner. Okay. So then my total annual probability of failure is going to be the sum of all the values in this table. So I'm going to go ahead and scroll down here and get that summed up. All those like that right there. So APS you should have gotten should be 2.27 times 10 to the minus 7. Okay. So then from there to get, I need the uh, exposure weighted incremental life loss, which will then allow me to calculate the average annual life loss. So for life loss, it's only going to be a function of um, stage. So we need to get our incremental consequences and then weight them day and night. So to start with, let's get the, take the day exposure, we'll multiply that by our day life loss. So I'll, that, there's my X value, X array, Y array, comma, one, comma, zero, 
And then I'm going to subtract from that the day non-breach life loss. So I've got my, basically what I've got going here. Let's make sure I do this correctly. All right, so I've got my, I'm interpolating to get my day life loss for the breach. I'm subtracting from that the night life loss then I'm multiplying that by um, the day exposure. So that's going to be my first term. Then my second term, I'm going to do the exact same thing, but now I've got to do it for uh, the night. So as a shortcut, I'm going to go ahead and copy all of this and then start moving some stuff over. So I know that instead of C82, it needs to go to D82. And then instead of being column C, it needs to be in column D. And instead of G, it needs to be in H. Hopefully I did that correctly. Now, I need to be careful here. I haven't really locked anything that I, um, I need to lock the exposures, both row and column. And then for my headwater, I need to make sure that I lock the row it looks like. So I'll have the dollar signs in front of the number and all of these. Does that look good? All right. So I should get a number of 40 for this first one. When I drag it down, I should get the same thing for every PGA because it's only a function of the headwater. From there, I should be able to drag over and that is going to be my exposure weighted incremental life loss. Okay. So then for my average annual life loss, that is going to be the annual probability of failure times the exposure weighted incremental life loss. Drag that over and down. And then to get the total, I will sum all the values in that table right here. I get 1.05 times 10 to the minus 5. So then N bar is going to be the average annual life loss divided by the annual probability of failure. I should get 46. So if done correctly, I should get a total that plots there right on the right about the 10 to the minus 5 average annual life loss range and you know, somewhere between 10 to the minus 6 and 10 to the minus 7. Okay. Qu questions on the homework? I think most people got it right. There were only a couple people that um, didn't do it correctly but made, you know, pretty simple um, minor mistakes that are easy to correct. Seemed like everybody understood, I guess, the concept and the procedure at least. So, questions? Even before I go over here, I, I've lost my video. My meeting's not doing what? What's the, the, the N bar result over? Uh, the N bar should be 46. Okay, thank you very much. Not 42, like we talked about on email. <laughs> no, no, not 42. That made me chuckle. I'm glad you got the joke. <laughs> right on. All right. Um, any questions on homework? So we calculated the joint loading. And then in the second step, we just used the system response that had already been provided. Correct? Yes. Um, is there a time where we would use that joint loading that we came up with? If that wasn't provided, is that what we have used? Uh, not following. So, again, the joint loading is mm -hmm. the combination of hazards. This is our basically our ha combined hazard probability. The system response is always going to be Robert. something that phone number. When you speak the phone number, please speak slowly and leave it for me twice, unless it's someone I 
that I already know and I have your number. Thank you. All right. Sorry about that. So, again, our we're always going to have the, the joint loading is going to be a function of hazards. And then the team is going to, risk assessment team is going to elicit the system response that you have here. Yeah, thank you. So, Sorry. All good. So, again, you'll have that table and then, you know, joint loading times your system so first, response gets you the AP. So, the first table was, um, if you look up back up at the, um, scroll all the way up. Keep going to the actual um, event tree. So the first table is just the stage duration and the seismic hazard. So just like essentially this beginning of the um, tree together. Yes. So here, let me. And then the next one is up. the result. Yep. No, I'm with you. Thank you. Yeah. Here, I'll give you a good visual of what we were doing here. That's not the right one. Let's try again. This one here. So whenever we get through the hundreds of slides and get to the actual seismic stuff. Getting closer. There we go. So basically what we're doing is what you see here. So each, uh, the seismic hazard is split into and each seismic hazard table then has a set of headwater intervals that we're gonna look at. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of how it would break out if we did it in event tree form. Um, yep. A lot easier to do it in a table though. Yes, it is. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Any other questions? Any questions on any of the other examples that we went through in module three? Hey, yes, Damon, I do have a couple questions. Um, so my first one is, I guess if Example 3.2 might be the easiest one, but either one of the first two you can pick. Um, for failure modes two and three, you're using a transform function. So for failure mode two, you're you're estimating using the discharge. But when you do the consequence estimates, you're using stage. And I guess I will curiously can practice how common is that and, you know, could you also do you do you find yourselves often estimating consequences based on stage or sometimes is it based on discharge? You know, I guess they don't the failure mode and the consequences don't have to be estimated the same way or interpolated from the same, you know, X variable. But um, I was curious. I, I kind of noticed that I was curious to hear you talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, right on. So consequences are or at least breach consequences are typically going to be a function of stage. I mean, the, the, typically the driving factor for that is going to be how much water you have in the, the reservoir for at the time that fails. Um, Non-breach life loss, however, can sometimes be done. Sometimes they do it as a function of stage. Sometimes it's better to do it as a function of uh, discharge. So that's kind of up to the economist and the modeler to decide what they want to use. Um, and then, like you pointed out, the, the system response, I mean, that's really just a function of the failure mode and what really drives it. So they don't have to be consistent one way or the other. Okay. And then uh, I think in when you're interpolating the system response probability, you use the log log in. And so I guess you're doing that because uh, you've already interpolated once, uh, but now you're transforming and you're using two, you know, there's a logarithmic plot there twice. I guess that's why you're using log log in. Can you just kind of talk through that one more time? Right. We're using log for the outflow and then log for the probability. Reason being is because when you look at that, let's scroll up and find the actual relationship. 
mean, there's a more there's a order of magnitude change in the discharge, and sometimes there's even more than that. So depending on where you are, typically we'll use log for discharge, and then for the system response probability, we could have plotted it out, use log Z or use Z, but um, it's easier to plot, so we typically use log for system response. Okay, thank you. Okay. And then I had one last question. I don't, I was trying to find exactly where and when I wrote it down, but it was, I was, I wrote down, why don't you use Lindsay in when you, uh, you know, interpolate debris blockage gate probabilities? I think it's just linear interpolation, but I wish I could remember why I wrote that down and where, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway just to get them all out of the way so I don't interrupt again. <laughs> I don't know if it was for that particular fail, uh, example or if it was from a different one. So. No, it was probably for this one because we go down um, when we get to the total risk calculation, we need the probability associated with the uh, blockage scenario. Um, reason I use, yeah, the reason I use linear here is because there wasn't a big change from one to the other. So we're, we're going from 0 0.225 to 0.375. So regardless what I pick, it's, I don't think it's going to make a big difference. So I don't know that there, I think the convention has been to do that linearly, but like I said, I don't think it's going to make much difference and I don't know that it would really, you know, there's, there's no hard and fast rule for that one. No, I think that makes sense because you're interpolating probabilities between zero and one as opposed to like annual exceedance probabilities, which can be you know, several orders of magnitude different. So that's right. maybe where you would use a z-variant interpolation as opposed to yeah. here where it's, also it's a much smaller range that you're interpolating from. So it doesn't look like you're suggesting it doesn't really matter. Yeah, I would agree with that. Good question. Other questions? So what did you all think of module three? This is this is the first time that we've done this particular module for this course. Um, I wanted to make sure that we covered, you know, those, you know, more complicated, but not all that, not all that unique kind of situations, debris blockage and gate inoperability come up a lot, um, as does, you know, seismic failure modes and things like that. Um, kind of warned you that things would kind of escalate quickly once we got past module two, but it seemed like from the submittals that everybody was mostly able to follow what was going on. I hope that was the case. Yeah, I would just echo the chat comment that it, it takes quite a long time to get through the examples. Yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of work there. And, you know, once you kind of do one and you get the hang of how to copy and paste and you realize, you know, the the presentation just sort of says, well, we're going to skip through all of this. So it was like, well, OK, I guess I can, <laughs> you know, copy and paste quite a bit because that's they're kind of skipping over that part. But the part that gets skipped over in the presentation, it takes a long time to get through that. So, yeah, it certainly does. Yeah, no, I get it. That was one of the reasons that, that this was a, a three week module instead of a, a two weeker for sure. But um, I'll think of ways to maybe um, ease that burden a little bit because I understand it was a lot. That said, I think it's worth it because I think you're right. Gate blockage and seismic are, are probably, I mean, do you find their risk drivers a lot at some of your projects? Certainly seismic, I would think. Certainly contributors. So, I mean, sometimes you don't know if they're going to drive the risk or not until you get into it. Um, you know, seems like, at least with the core, we've been getting a lot into the um, CSAC 3s recently. And, you know, when you got a gated structure and you've got, um, you know, potential for overtopping, if a couple of your gates don't work, you know, it, it kind of becomes a big deal. 
being able to handle that's important. I don't know why I always get the gated projects, <laughs> which make all the all the calculations that much more complicated. All right. Well, if nobody has any other questions, go back to this right here. So there is a the quiz should be loaded for module three out on uh, Socrative. Uh, the room name for this one is going to be DLS 105R3. Um, the buzzword for your for, for that first question is going to be earthquake. The buzzword is earthquake. So that'll get you credit for the quiz. And then we've got, I think, five questions that walk through some stuff on um, gate and operability and, you know, a lot of the stuff that we obviously talked about for Module 3. Um, past that, the uh, Module 4 files are loaded to uh, the RMC website. The video should finally be up on YouTube. We've got the transcripts. One thing I will say about this particular module is this is where we're going to start using at risk. So if you have it, then you're in good shape. If you don't, again, continue to try to get it, I guess. But if you, for whatever reason, can't get a copy of it, we've got workarounds to where you can get through the module without it. Certainly be preferred that you have it, but it's not a necessity, I guess I would say. So there, there's two different homework files. There's module four that says exercises and homework, and then another one under module four, but that one says no risk. That's going to be the one that you do not have at risk for. So when you open that one, uh, let's go ahead and just download that one, make sure it's the right one. He's telling me these are all signed module files. We don't need a toolbox. The toolboxes they, they, aren't signed. They they should be. The um, module three file was signed, and I it surprised me. Your email surprised me, saying it wasn't signed. No, no, module three was signed, and it worked great. But I had to copy the tabs in from the toolbox because it wasn't signed. The tool. Oh, I, I got you. So I, I'm following what you're saying. So the the toolbox that was out on the RMC website for the um, event combination box. I'm following now. Yeah. Now these should be signed, so you should be good to go. So here, here's an example of how it would look like um, if you don't have at risk. So there's certain things that you won't be able to do, but you're allowed, basically it's trying to give you the look and feel how you would do it. So for example, in this one, we're going to use a triangular distribution and that function is risk triang. And then you would put in the um, lowest value, your most likely value, and your highest reasonable value. When you do that, you're not going to get a result from this formula like you would in real life. But if you punch in the formula right, the spreadsheet will look and it'll give you the value that you would have gotten if you had it, if that makes any sense. so. It isn't perfect, but you can at least get a little bit of practice using those formulas, even if you don't have the program. I hope that makes sense. Um, if you're going to try to do the free trial, um, you can probably uh, contact them now and see if they're going to respond to you. Sometimes they respond, sometimes they don't. Um, now, when you um, get the free trial, it's, it's 15 days from the day you install it. So I would wait to install it until the very last week of this module. That way you would have one week to complete module four, and then you would have a week to, for module five, because we'll need it. We, you know, it'd be nice to have it for that one, too. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, But yeah, if um, nobody has any other questions, that's that's a wrap for module three, and we'll get going on 
Module 4, where we're going to start adding um, uncertainty to um, each piece of the risk equation and see how that affects our um, 